So I'm uh, the Managing Director of Divine Chocolate and I've been the Managing Director since the beginning. So I've spent the last 17 years um, I don't know, going to work and tasting chocolate. I've <laughs> 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 been too horrid. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what's, um, what's special about Divine is that the cocoa farmers in Ghana who are organised in a cooperative own 44% of the company. Um, and so they have seats on the board, they have a say in how the company is run, and then they get a share of the profit as well as the fair trade price. And so that's what's been sort of special to do. And so I haven't just been tasting chocolate and sort of telling people about chocolate. Um, and so I go back to Ghana and I talk to them about their chocolate company. I report to them at their AGM. And we produce a, our annual report in the form of a calendar um, so that they put it on the wall in each of the villages so that where they're within the cocoa shed so that every person who's a member of Coffer Cocoa can get to see how their company's doing. So we've done a lot of effort to try and be accountable to the farmers who are our owners. So we are a very different sort of chocolate company. So um, Rachel did ask me to come and tell you about the dark side of chocolate, and I'm not going to sort of ponder on that too much. And so the question that we've been asking for a long time now, because it's a different question to what other people are asking, is why would you be a cocoa farmer? So my children, I mean, so the reason I'm up here today is because my daughter's at Harriet Watt University. Um, and she's doing a brewing and distilling course, <laughs> um, which is fantastic. <laughs> and my son is 21. And so I've gone through that thing where your children come home and they say to you what they want to be. And you're sort of thinking, is that a good idea? You know, are they possibly going to you know, have a good livelihood, meet the right sort of people, live in the right sort of places? And so that I think what, you're, what we want to do through telling the story of Divine is, is sort of make you see that they're only people like us. And so when they're... If, if you were a cocoa farmer, would you want your child to be a cocoa farmer too? Because the average income for a cocoa farmer is about £328 a year. And that is um, no use from the point of view of if you're... If you, if you're because um, in some ways, people think that people living in developing countries in rural areas are living in non-cash economies, but that's not true. Because they're having to pay for lots of things, like fuel, like farming inputs, so things like... Um, fertilizers and pesticides are, ba are, are, are based on the price of oil. They're having to pay for fuel for moving things around. They're having to pay for food that they're not growing. When they send their children to school in Ghana, the Ghana government has a commitment to universal education, but you still have to pay for uniforms and books and pencils, and you need to pay for the children to be able to eat in the lunchtime if they live far away from you. And so actually those things all mound up. So your £328 is looking pretty, pretty poor. And so you have an inability to cover the costs, which does lead... Uh, and so in, in Ghana, there has also been, um, over the last three or four years, really terrible inflation. And so the value of your CD has been 25% less at the end of the year. So you might have been earning the same amount, but 25 by the end of the year, it's, it's worth three quarters of what it was at the beginning. And so you can buy three quarters with it. So if you weren't very well off at the beginning of the year, you're in a sort of disastrous state by the end. What that has meant is that it's led to all sorts of bad things happening in the cocoa industry. And one of the ones that's had um, the most coverage has been child labour. And there are, um, I mean, from a, from a definitional perspective, there's two different sorts of child labour. And so there's obviously the, the dreadful child labour, which is about trafficking children and them being entrapped in farms and being made to do things. I don't think uh, that that happens very much in Ghana. I mean, so that's not been what I've observed in Ghana. I think then, so that, that um, in some ways, you increase policing to try and stop that and you make very clear to everybody that that's unacceptable and that they will be punished for it. And then you also need to put together a mediation process so that if you find children, you do something with them. But in a Ghana context, probably the thing that's more complicated is to do with the different tasks on a farm. So if, you're, if, you were bringing up, if you were a farmer in Britain and you were bringing up your children and you want them to be farmers, then they're going to have to learn how to farm. But the idea that they're doing appropriate things at an appropriate age becomes very important. And the Ghana government has worked very closely with uh, cocoa farmers to try and look at those issues and sort of unpick them. So when you're growing cocoa, you are, um, at some points, you're, you're, you're um, planting seeds and things, and that's sort of all that would be all right for children to do at the right age where they were doing it sensibly, I suppose. Um, you cut down the cocoa pod, which looks like a rugby ball, and then you cut it open with a machete. And clearly it would be good not to use machetes until you were you know, 14 or 15 and knew how to use them properly, but you do need to learn how to use them. So they're sort of saying you shouldn't do that until later. 
And then there are um, carrying things, and so there's quite a nice definition of the amount you should carry in proportion to the size you are. So you could carry a little thing if you're little, but if you're a big person, then you can carry a big thing. But having those conversations and actually printing you know, brochures saying that this is what you should do starts to change the conversation. So farmers start to have a conversation about what it would be good, you know, what it's acceptable for your children to do and what it's not acceptable to do. And one of the things that I've been pleased that Quapa has made real progress on is that um, the worst thing for children to be on the farm doing is if you are if you are using um, pesticides and fertilizers. So you because the cocoa uh, tree, so the cocoa tree grows tall, and you've got then the foliage and the uh, pods tend to grow inside on the trunk. So you're spraying above you and it's pouring on your head, sort of really. And so if your child's on the farm at the time. Um, then clearly they're getting covered in pesticide. So that what what's happened is Quapa has been very so Quapa Coco. I'll go on to tell you that's their name. That's the farms I work with. Have have opened up the conversation about why that's not a good idea. And what's been interesting about that is you. I was quite aware of the fact that if you start telling people what they should do with their children, they can get quite pissed off with you. Really, you know, they sort of feel like they're my children. I'll do what I want with them. And so I was interested to see was it working? Were you having a conversation with the farmers where the farmers were actually joining in, or were they thinking? They're telling us what to do will look like we're doing it, but we're actually ignoring you, really. And what they said was that the parents were actually thanking them for explaining that these things make you sick. And so then it was making them store them in a better way. So it's making them store them in cupboards that weren't where they were living. And so it wasn't opening buckets in their rooms, which is how they were previously doing it. And I met a farmer where I said, how do you test the uh, dilution of the of, of the things of the chemicals you're using? And he put his finger in and went like this, and you're sort of going. So they're stopping doing that, <laughs> and they've also understood that you shouldn't have children there. And then we've done a we've done a very nice project, which has been on a very small scale, but we were testing an idea that if you worked with children and get them to understand about rights and responsibilities, then they're able to have a conversation with their caregivers. So whether that's elders in the community or their actual parents, they're able to start to say. I shouldn't be doing this. I know. How are you able to have that conversation? And it's sort of quite interesting if you think about all the awful abuse that's happened to children in Britain. Is at the point when children start to understand that they have a right to say, then you start to push it out. And so that sense that you're actually starting to shift culture, I think, is quite an important thing. It was a very small scale, but it actually had very positive results. So we're now trying to share those results with with the industry. So. Given all of those in that, 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 those problems, it's not surprising that the next generation of cocoa for, of children aspire to be nurses, teachers, sea mistress. I've met fantastic girls who want to be judges because they think that would solve lots of problems because they think people spend so much time arguing with each other and in dispute and not getting past it. Um, and so there's lots of things that children want to be, but very few of them want to be cocoa farmers. And that actually then causes us a problem because we all love chocolate. And so if we want to carry on enjoying chocolate, then cocoa farmers need to have a sustainable remuneration. They need enough to invest in their farms and their families and a fairer share of the value they're creating. So Divine's story is the amazing story of cocoa farmers who voted to set up their own chocolate company. That's Beatrice Ashanti, and that's her with her cocoa the drying on a bamboo table up at waist level. It's a very, it's slightly out of focus, which I'm not quite sure why, but it's a very Ghanaian picture because in lots of other countries they dry cocoa on the floor. Whereas in Ghana, they dry, dry it on these bamboo um, mats, which they roll up if it's raining or they roll up if it's too hot. And they do it outside their houses so that nobody's nicking their cocoa. And so you can sort of tell that's from Ghana. Okay. So, Divine's, uh, so Divine was established in 1998 and our mission was to grow a successful global farmer-owned chocolate company using the amazing power of chocolate to delight and engage and bring people together to create dignified trading relations, thereby empowering both producers and consumers. I think that the fact that you're all here today shows that chocolate sort of gets people to come in. Yeah. <laughs> and what's been interesting to me over the 17 years I've been working at Divine is actually virtually nobody has not met me. I mean, so if I say, could could I have a meeting with you to talk to you? If I if you say you're coming from a chocolate company, virtually everybody says yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. And so I've ended up sort of meeting prime ministers and chancellors of the exchequer and heads of supermarkets and the Queen and um, and archbishops, that, yeah. because actually they're all interested. And then if I want to go into a school, I get a good crowd in a school too. <laughs> and so it's quite interesting to use the power of chocolate as a um, engine for sort of social change and sort of to show people that actually everything's made of something and people make things. And what about the people who make the things that you are enjoying every day? 
And so certainly, the, I mean, so my background is I didn't come from a development background. I came, I came, actually came from the film industry, but I've done a lot of anti-apartheid um, campaigning. So I'm that generation. I'm the last generation of anti-apartheid campaigners. And what um, struck me about <coughs> anti-apartheid campaigning was that if you could use the, the passion and um, uh, energy of that boycott and actually turning it into positive purchasing, then we might be able to work, make the world more like the way we'd like it to be. And so my interest is actually in helping people in Britain feel like they can make a difference because I think, I think we can be overwhelmed, particularly with all of the sort of social media and the news, with just sort of continual barrage of awfulness that's happening everywhere in the world, sometimes from completely um, natural causes, sometimes from people being really awful to each other. And you sort of feel disempowered by that. And as if, you know, how can I do anything about it? And isn't this all hopeless? And I do actually think that if we all paid a bit more attention about the goods and services that we purchase, then we could actually make some inroads into that. So the chocolate market's huge. Um, so it's not just sweeties. So the, cho the, 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 world, um, the world chocolate market is $107 billion. So that's really big. The UK market is four billion pounds. And so that's actually quite surprising, isn't it? If you think you're buying a bar of chocolate that costs a pound or two pounds. That's, that's a lot of chocolate that we're all eating. Um, why, we, why I've done that slide, though, is that the world cocoa market is 10 billion. So it's only a tenth of the total chocolate market. So obviously there are other ingredients in chocolate, but the valuable ingredients in chocolate is chocolate, is cocoa. And so actually what we're trying to do in Divine is get the farmers a share of the wealth of the chocolate market as opposed to just selling to cocoa. Um, the other thing about the UK chocolate market is it's incredibly mature and very competitive. So that £4 billion market has three companies owning more than 80% of it. And so that although it looks like you've got this huge choice, all of the products are from Kraft, which owns Cadbury's, and Toblerone and Dime Bars, and from Mars, who own uh, Twixes and Maltesers and uh, Dove Bars, and then from Nestle, who own Kit Kat bars and lots of sort of other things. That you know. And so that 80% of four, four, 4 billion is controlled by three enormous multinational corporations. In the 20%, you've got Lint, and they're huge too. <laughs> and so you sort of can see that we're walking into a market um, that is so dominated by ginormous people. And those companies spend above the line. I mean, so their advertising for something like Kit Kat is six million pounds a year in the UK. So that sort of sense that you're coming into a market of people who've got so much money and so much power. And what the thing about those bars of chocolates that I've just mentioned is that your grandparents were probably eating them. So that sort of sense of if I say chocolate, what do you say back? You say Cadbury's. If I say chocolate and I say, say a colour and you'll say purple. And so it's sort of embedded into your head that, oh, I fancy a bar of chocolate. Ooh. Actually, I'm going to go and eat a bar of Cadbury's. So I'm, I'm describing you that because actually when we set up in 1998, it was, a, it was an audacious proposition that we were going to set up a chocolate company owned by cocoa farmers in one of the most valuable markets in the world. And that we were going to, you know, and, and the fact that we're here today is down to people like you, actually. You know, so if people like all of us hadn't gone into shops and asked for these products and gone out of our way to get them stocked, we couldn't possibly have done it because we didn't have the six million pounds to spend on the advertising. <laughs> and so the story really began, our story began in 1993 in Ghana, um, which was when the, mar the cocoa market in Ghana was semi-liberalised. And so up to that point, all of the cocoa had been bought and sold by the government. So the farmers would grow it, a government agent would buy it from them, and then would sell it on the international market. And that was deeply problematic. Um, <coughs> certainly from talking to farmers, there was a lot of corrupt people working in it, and they couldn't trust the transaction. So because they were needing cash, they had to sell it to the person who was the agent that came to them. But they couldn't challenge the transaction, so they just had to sort of carry on with it. But it, it wasn't good. So what, um, what a charismatic farmer who was on the agricultural board in 1993 thought was that the liberalisation of the market was actually an opportunity to set up a cocoa uh, cooperative, um, which was going to be run by farmers for farmers. And so Quokka Quokka was born. And they started with uh, 2,000 members in 22 villages across the Croco growing belt in Ghana. And they very quickly developed a reputation for being honest and efficient. And they, they did that partly by buying weighing scales. So in each of the 22 villages that they operated in, they bought a weighing scale. 
And then they carried around a 25 kilo weight, so you could ask to have the weighing scales checked, so you could trust it. Farmers tend to test the weighing scales by actually standing on it themselves, so they test it with their own weight. Um, and then eventually, Quapper also employed um, technicians to maintain the scales, so that you kept them working, working well. And that meant that people really trusted the transaction. And so by the time I joined in 1999, and I went to their AGM, they had um, 200, they had 25,000 members in 250 villages, so they did rapidly grow. And they now have over 80,000 members in 1,257 <coughs> villages across the cocoa growing belt in Ghana. What's amazing about that number and amazing about the whole story is they're running a democratic organisation. So you uh, go and vote, you go and join your, in your village, and then if you want to, you could stand to be on the executive in your village. And then if you sort of got a bit more um, practice, then you might want to stand for a regional election. And then ultimately, you could stand to be on the national executive committee. And um, they're doing that in villages where you haven't got access to, you, you're using water from rivers, you haven't got electricity, you haven't got computers, and the level of illiteracy among men is 65% and among women is 85%. And so the idea of trying to run a democratic organisation, I mean, I don't know if any of you run anything. I mean, so if you're part of something in your church or in your you know, uh, women's institute or political party, actually think how easy it is for us to organise. We, we can all read and write. We can send uh, you know, emails to 100 people with the press of a button. We can put things up on websites. I mean, it's so, so easy compared with what they're doing. And so the fact that they've actually managed to run a democratic organisation in that environment, I think is um, phenomenal, actually, and, and certainly is one of the things that motivates me. So they then have an AGM, and they've been very committed to women's empowerment from the beginning. And it's quite interesting to see, because people sort of go about women's empowerment. It costs an awful lot of money. It's a terrible lot of trouble. <laughs> they're not very good. And so what they did was, right at the beginning, they set quotas at a village level. And so on the executive at a village level, if there's five people on the executive, two of them have to be women. And then what they did was that for their annual general meeting, they, they did it that two people have to go from each village because one of them has to be a woman. And, that's, and doing that right from the beginning says what they're about. It says what, 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 they're, what, what they're intending to do. And it means that when you talk to women now who are members and you say, why did you join Quapa Coco? They say, well, people told me that you actually had opportunities as women if you joined this organisation and that you could do well as a woman. And that's just completely unheard of in COCO organisations. And so they now have, of that 80,000 plus membership, 35% are women, which is over the amount of women who are in cocoa farming, so as, as a percentage. So they're over-indexing on women's participation. And in 2006, they, invoke, they voted for more women than men on their National Executive Committee. And in 2010, they elected their first woman president. And in 2014, they elected a different woman president. And so they've done phenomenally well. And those, that, these are women who left school at 14. Um, and they're now in charge of an organisation with more than 80,000 people, with more than 200 employees, turning over 48,000 tonnes of cocoa, which is nearly a mi nearly $100 million turnover. And so that's sort of that's what doing business differently looks like. Yeah. So in 1998, Divine Chocolate was there. So so in 1997 at the AGM, their farmers voted to set up a chocolate company. And in 1998, Divine Chocolate was launched as the first mainstream fair trade chocolate company. And what we meant by mainstream was that the chocolate tasted how you hoped chocolate would taste. <laughs> That it was available in the sorts of places you expected to buy chocolate, but you weren't having to go really sort of into sort of weirdy places to go to go and get it, um, and that it wasn't super premium, so that if you you could you could afford to buy it, it might be more than Cadbury's, but it wasn't so expensive that you couldn't choose to buy it. So um, the story of Divine is so you can see on the bar, on the bars that we've got a fair trade mark on all of the bars. And so Divine is fair trade and beyond, and so we're the only fair trade chocolate company that is owned by cocoa farmers. But, but, and we think fair trade delivers reliable income and funds to invest in better living and working standards. But we think that company ownership delivers uh, so much more. It, it delivers profit, knowledge and power. Because when you own things, you control them. And that's a very different relationship. So that fair trade is good because it gives farmers more income. And it's good because the farmers get to decide how they use that income. But ownership actually changes the whole conversation. So in, in cocoa, what fair trade means, just so that you know, is there's a guaranteed minimum price of $2,000 a tonne. 
That means if the world market price goes below two thousand dollars, we pay two thousand dollars. At the moment, we're paying more than three thousand dollars because that's the world market price. So we so it only cuts in if the price goes below a certain level. But we also pay two hundred dollars a ton in addition to whatever price we pay, which is a social premium, which the farmers then democratically decide how they spend it. Um, we have long-term contracts. We've obviously had a very long-term relationship with Copper Cocoa because we've been with them for 17 years. Um, they have lots of um, minimum health and safety conditions that they have to do, and so they have to demonstrate um, that they're not using child labour, that they're committed not to use child labour. But they also have to demonstrate that what, what, what chemicals they are using and there are chemicals they're not allowed to use, and that they're storing those chemicals properly and using them with um, proper protective um, gear and things. Um, they have a commitment to education and training and the empowerment of women. And then I think the thing that's important about the fair trade mark is that I think they spend a lot of time telling you about a fair deal, and obviously farmers need a fair deal, and that's what's emotionally making you engage with this. But I think it's important that it's actually an independent audit function. And so it's actually a consumer guarantee. So I would say this about my chocolate, wouldn't I? <laughs> and so what you need to know as, a, as consumers is that it's actually true. And so what they do is they, they I have to give them quarterly declarations and then they come and audit my, um, my accounts and say, so they pull receipts and things. And then they look at all of the my, people in my supply chain, so the manufacturer, and make sure that they're doing the same, the right thing. And then they go and visit the farmers and they're checking that the money gets to the farmers unencumbered so that people aren't taking sort of margins off it on the way. That the farmers are then making democratic decisions about how they're spending that money and that then they're implementing those decisions in an effective way. And so now, because Crop is so big, they're spending a month in there with three auditors. So this is a seriously checked process. And that should give you as consumers uh, confidence in the proposition. And so what I means so they're going to, they're, they start by looking at minutes of meetings, but then they go to villages and say, well, it said you were in the meeting. Were you in the meeting? What happened in the meeting? What did you decide? And then they're looking to see, well, have you decided to build a school? How did you put it out to tender? Did you manage to do it? Is there a school there? Is it functioning? So there, it, it's in the same level as an audit where it's a spot check, so it's not everything. But it, it, it is, uh, I think, a good guarantee that what we're saying is happening is, is happening. Um, and I think then the exciting thing from Divine's perspective is we set out to change the way the chocolate industry works by being the threat of a good example. We wanted to show that even at the scale that we're operating on, you can do business better. And what um, and so that the next figure, the thirty thousand tons of cocoa that have been bought for the fair trade market in the UK over the over two thousand and fourteen, is a huge success. So when we set out in nineteen ninety nine, we couldn't have imagined that in two thousand and nine you would have had Cadbury's convert Cadbury's dairy milk to fair trade, and then quite quickly you would have had Mars convert Maltesers to fair trade and Kit Kat convert Kit Kat to fair trade. So those those were big changes. And in a way, um, Divine and all of the people who bought Divine enabled that to happen because they showed that people in Britain cared about those things so that it would be a positive, it would be perceived as positively. But the other thing that Divine did is that we worked with Cropper Cocoa and we helped them become an organisation that had the scale to supply chocolate to organisations as big as Cadbury's. Because one of the things that those big companies have said is there just isn't enough cocoa from fair trade farmers. And so we made that not true. And so that when Cadbury's converted, they took 20,000 tonnes of cocoa, and Quapple were the only farmers' organisation that would have been big enough to supply that. And so it's quite interesting that, in a way, so Divine made possible those, those, those changes. Um, so uh, in Quapple Cocoa, the farmers have made the decision about how to spend their money. Uh, they would spent lots of it on sinking water wells. Access to clean water is very important, obviously from a health and hygiene perspective. But it's interestingly important for, women, for girls' uh, development because uh, girls tend to have to go and get the water, and if you have to go to uh, you know, an hour there and an hour back to carry the water, possibly twice a day, in the light time. So it's light in the equator from six till six. So you've only got 12 hours. And so then if you spend this much time in school and then you spend four hours a day going and getting water, you've got no time to do homework. So you can't actually do well at school. So having a water well in the village improves the, 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 the opportunity to, for girls to do better in their education. Then Quapper has built um, a number of schools, so I think they've now built 10 schools because um, I think this is a problem the world over actually, so governments make commitments to deliver universal education and then there is a real um, challenge about the quality of the buildings. So.
<laughs> and so in rural areas, the quality of the buildings is really problematic. That's particularly true here, isn't it? You <laughs> I, I, I just remember. <laughs> so even new ones can be a bit rubbish. <laughs> um, so what Proper has done, I mean, so and not having good buildings means it's very difficult to recruit and retain good teachers. So if you think you're asking teachers to be right in the middle of nowhere when everybody really wants to be in the city, and then you're going to be actually standing in a pile of mud because there's no roof or there actually isn't a building at all it's very difficult to recruit decent teachers and then the children don't do well. So then the farmers who sent their children to school have actually wasted their time and money and that's really awful. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so what Quop has done is it's built these schools and then handed them over to appropriate people to run them because they don't want to be running schools and, and had a memorandum of understanding so that Cocoa Farmers' children will disproportionately be able to get into the schools so they won't then be excluded. Um, and then another thing they've done, along with their commitment to women in terms of uh, quotas, they've also recognised that women need to um, build their confidence. And so they've done some quite interesting income generation schemes where they've trained women in doing things like making soap, um, make, uh, baking bread, um, making palm oil, from so extracting palm oil from palm nuts. Um, the soap is made out of palm as well. And um, doing batik making. And I mean, so certainly one village I went into, I saw this sort of uh, rabbit hutch on legs, very new, and so it stuck out, so it's all clean and new. So, so she went, oh, what's that? And they took me over to it, and it had this snail in it that was about this big. And so they're also cultivating snails to sell on the local market. So the idea of the income generation schemes is it gives uh, women more income at times when they're not earning money from cocoa. Because one of the things that's a bit sad about cocoa farming is you start to earn your money in October and if you're sending your children to school you need the money in the beginning of September so it's when you're poorest. So it's quite a bad arrangement. And so they're, they're, they're earn, uh, earning additional income from, from doing these schemes but they're also um, building their confidence in understanding how to be business people. And so one of the things that they've really uh, appreciated from the training is the idea that if you're going to sell soap made out of palm oil and it's going to take you time, then you need to cost in the cost of the ingredients and your time and then work out the price that you're selling it at. That sounds sort of obvious, but it isn't obvious until somebody tells you. So you don't realise that all you're doing is circulating money. You're not actually making money if you haven't properly priced it. So, what does own so that was sort of what fair trade delivered. What does ownership mean? So ownership means um, that farmers get the money, so they are the sole suppliers of the cocoa, they get the fair trade price for their cocoa, but we also invest 2% of our turnover in producer support and development, which is programmes that are mutually agreed upon um, to help them build their business and do business better. And so they, that money's been used to train people on cooperative principles and values, to train people on agricultural practices, to help them build a database for their membership so that they can have good management information systems to help them use those systems. We're actually funding at the moment, which is quite nice things. Um, and then because they own 44% of the company, they get 44% of any of the profits that we've distributed and we've just paid over a dividend because we just had our AGM and so that's very exciting to be able to share the profits. So we're saying we're sharing the profits and you're sort of going, but we need to make profits before you can share them. And so it was very satisfying in 2007 when we made our first profit and handed over a big cheque at the AGM saying, here's, here's your profit for this. <laughs> so we help them share, have a share of the wealth that they've helped to create. And also, ultimately, they then have um, shares in a company, which means they've got collateral to attract loans. Well, then another thing that ownership does is give you knowledge. One of the things that struck me when I first went there in 1999 is I met 500 farmers and none of those farmers had ever tasted chocolate. So they spent all of their time growing cocoa and they didn't know where it went. Nobody bothered to tell them actually. And so historically people had told them because I think Cadbury's had worked quite well on the ground probably eight, uh, probably a hundred years earlier. And so they'd been working with them about the quality and they probably had a bit more of a sense of where it was going. But because Ghana is a very hot country, it's not a place that's very good for selling chocolate because it all melts. So it's, not, it's, it's it's not a conspiracy, but it is disempowering because if you don't know what you're doing leads to, why would you want to do it? Why would you care about the quality of it? Why would you sort of go to the effort? And also, why would you feel secure about it? Why would you, where would you, why would you know that you're going to be able to sell it next year? So the first thing that we have done is take a lot of chocolate to Ghana. So each year when I go to Ghana and I speak at their AGM, I bring chocolate for everybody who turns up at the AGM. So that makes me popular. <laughs> <laughs> but it also means they get to taste it. They get to see what it's about. And they, I mean, so in the divine bars, inside the wrappers, we say the story. And so that sort of sense of seeing that it's actually about them, that's amazing to them. 
Um, and then they come to Britain and they do tours and they've been mm -hmm. up, to, up here. They've been mm -hmm. further than here, haven't they? I've seen pictures of them in Aberdeen and things. In the snow, they got stuck. Um, <laughs> the tam in the snow. That's quite entertaining. Uh, so they come to Britain and they travel round and they come to America and they travel round. And the thing that's striking to them about that is um, we eat all the time. So they're really astonished by how much they get offered to eat, but also can we just not eat all the time. <laughs> um, but they're also amazed that people are actually genuinely interested about how they live. They, you know, that people want to know how you cultivate cocoa, but they also want to know about how do you send your children to school, what do you do if somebody's sick. They're amazed that people are interested. So when you hear them reporting back when they go back to Ghana, that that's the thing that's most surprising them, is that there's a whole pile of people here who clearly are much better off than them and have got lives that they're sort of dreaming about, but that they, you, you, you know, you've noticed them, you've thought about them, you've bothered to turn up and talk to them. And so they found that quite amazing. I did take them to Eden where they saw cocoa growing and they were slightly concerned about that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but what we, what we, so, so the farmers have got to meet all sorts of people, retailers, politicians, activists. Um, when Gordon Brown was Chancellor, he had them up for tea every year, actually. It wasn't something we went public with, they just went and had tea and cakes with him. And it was sort of, that's amazing, actually. I mean, so it was sort of one of the nice things. Mm -hmm. um, but they've also had access to lots more information about good farming practices, and, and why, why you should do different things, you know, and why some things are working better. And then they've shared their knowledge both agriculturally and in terms of being a co-op with other cocoa farmers. So the cocoa farmers in Sierra Leone, cocoa farmers in Cameroon. And so we've run programmes where they get to go and sit, visit them and those farmers get to visit them. And they've also gone and seen, say, big successful coffee cooperatives because the only other cooperatives in Africa that are running at the scale that Papa Coco is are the coffee cooperatives. So they've gone over and seen people like the Mantindo over in... Uganda. Uganda. So they've gone. So like when they got elected onto the national executive committee, and you want to understand what it's going to be like running such a big organisation, then they've gone and seen some other organisations. Which mm. So then ultimately, ownership is about power. So when you know why you want to own your own house is you can do what you want with it. You can paint the door the colour you want. If the roof's falling in, you can choose to fix it, or you can choose not to. And that's why you like owning things. And so the, what um, the farmers owning divine means is that they have seats on the board, they send their president, their, their elected president and their head of the trading company, which means they have influence on how the business is developed. But it also changes the whole way we talk about farmers because they are owners. So we're not talking about hopeless people who we don't know the names of, who are a bit pathetic. We're talking about people who are our owners, who are sitting on our board, who we are accountable to and who ultimately can sack me. I mean, that completely changes how you talk about each other. Um, what's interesting as well is that um, within the whole conversation that's happened about, say, child labour over the last 15 years, everybody's sort of gotten round in a frenzy and they've had these huge meetings. I remember attending a meeting in the Foreign Office in London and it had all of the sort of great and good NGOs and big corporate companies and maybe a few ministers from appropriate countries. And they would sit there and they all suck their teeth about what were they going to do about these awful things. And you sort of go, well, have you thought about talking to the farmers? And they all looked at you like, who is this sort of strange woman? <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm, and then they're going, well, we've invited the minister from Ghana. And I'm going, yeah, he's great, but he's not a farmer. <laughs> you know, and I'm not sure that he's actually talked to a farmer either, actually. And so that sort of sense of then, then when, so, so, so probably some of the better ones understood what I was talking about, but then they didn't know how they could talk to farmers because they didn't know any farmers. They, you know, how, how did you talk to farmers? <laughs> And so actually what was interesting <coughs> was that because we've made Quapa famous, because every bar of chocolate says that it's owned by Quapa Coco and it's got stories of people in the inside, actually they then started to include Quapa Coco in and they'd ask them to come and speak at their events and they'd go and visit Quapa Coco to sort of say to them what did they think about these issues. And that's quite interesting because actually what we've done is personalised the relationship because actually we don't know where anything comes from. And even once we get to the thought of thinking, well, it must come from somebody somewhere and they must be doing some work, we still don't know who they are. Whereas we've sort of put a name and a face to these people, which then means that they're the people who get asked what they think. And that's quite a powerful place to be. So they have a voice in the chocolate industry. And ultimately, because of their cooperative, I think they have control over their future. So they can make collective decisions about how they choose to invest the extra income that they're getting. And ultimately, by being organised, the world's their oyster. So, what does success look like? Uh, Copper Coco receives four income streams from Divine. So, the, you get the fair trade price, you get the fair trade premium, the $200, and then you get the 2% of our turnover. 
um, which we invest in those programs, and then they get 44% of any distributed profits. Since Divine was established in 1998, we have turned over more than 100 million pounds, which means we have delivered more than 2 million pounds in producer support and development programs, and over 205,000 pounds in distributed profits. So we're quite little, you know, we're still little people, but that's what we've managed to do. And so sort of in a way, when you're hearing big corporations say the nice things they're doing, I hope the thing that you think about is proportionality. So if you're a company that's turning over billions of pounds, what proportion of your money are you spending doing the right thing? <laughs> and actually, what about doing the right thing in the first place and not making such a huge profit in the first place? <laughs> no. so, that's, that's, so I think it's important that those of us who are sort of concerned consumers and consumer activists are actually saying, no, it's not good enough that you did one nice thing somebody, somewhere. That's kind of easy, isn't it? You're a big, huge company. You're operating across the whole world. What are you doing? How, how are you doing that on an appropriate scale? Um, so Divine merged um, our business. So we set up a business in the USA in 2008, and we made that profitable by 2014. So we got our first profit out of the American market. And no, it's very difficult for British companies to work in an American context. And so we've sort of done something that really everybody said we wouldn't manage to do, and that was very <laughs> satisfying. So we pushed the two companies together. And we now, in the, in, so in 2013, 14-15, uh, because our year ends at the end of June, um, we had our highest turnover ever, and, we grew, we, uh, and, 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 and that means that we are growing to reach both producers and consumers around the world. So we sell in um, 14 territories. Uh, we've got really nice market in Sweden and in Holland and in Norway and in Canada, and then doing very nicely in America, and then we've got some sort of little territories in like Japan and Australia and South Korea. Okay. And so then this was what I was going to say, what we were spending money on in the, this year on, in terms of our producer support and development. So one of the things that we did was, to for Coopa to celebrate their 21st birthday, we wanted to look at what had been the impact of their commitment to gender empowerment. And what we found was that the women's membership was really good and women were definitely more confident and more likely to join Coopa Coco, but they weren't appearing in the... Uh, hierarchy in the way that it, at the same level, so they weren't 35% of the hierarchy, and so what we looked at was why, what, what was, what was the barrier to that, and that we found that the literacy level was shocking, and so that the women's literacy illiteracy is 85%, and that gets sort of higher the older they are, and so in um, central region the cocoa farmers are averagely 55 plus, in western region they're more like 45 plus, and you can see the literacy level improve where they're younger. And so what we did was we set up a literacy and numeracy scheme, which is in nine villages, where they're doing two hours three times a week, and we're doing it with the Department for Non-Formal Education in Ghana. And it's really interesting to see how people's confidence build as they start to be able to read and write. So it's not that they couldn't do math, so they could add up, but they couldn't write it down. And so it's quite interesting what you know which you can't write down. And so that by being able to write down numbers, you can then call people to account. And by able to read, I mean, so if you ask people very early on in reading, what, were they, what was the benefits of reading? Things like when you went into town, you could work out which bus you needed to get on because you could see what the destination says. And so actually, because we've all read the whole of our lives, it's difficult to sort of remember what it was like if you couldn't and how disempowering that was. So that scheme's going very interestingly, I mean it is, and the results of it are very interesting because we had the official language in Ghana is English and we'd hoped to move the whole cohort to English. After the first year, we've started to do half of the cohort to English in the second year and so it's taken much longer, but I think that actually probably proves that it's real, so I think that's probably good. And then um, obviously a big challenge of talking to your membership in any way when they're so dispersed and they're illiterate. And so one of the things that we've done is develop a series of radio programs. And so they do a series of eight hour long radio programs, which has a phone in element. So you can see that people are phoning in and talking to it, which includes all sorts of things. So it includes you know, what you should be doing at this time in the season in terms of agricultural practices. It includes what being a member of a co-op is and how you could get to be a member of Quapa. It includes the fact that you own Divine. And what we're hearing anecdotally is people are listening to that in their village together. So they're putting it on a radio and sitting around and having a conversation about it. And so that seems to be working very nicely, and they've reached now more than 45,000 members because you're, you, you broadcast in regions, and so that's quite, quite good. And then the last thing that we did, which was just a straightforward piece of donation, so we raised money, um, and we bought um, 
bamboo bikes for children to help children who live further away get to school. And the bamboo bikes are made in Ghana, so then it means it's supporting a social enterprise in Ghana, which is training people to make the bikes. You're making the frames out of bamboo, obviously, not the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> They're very good bikes, and actually they sell for a lot of money, both in uh, America and in Poland. And so, what it, so it's been quite interesting trying to manage that we get the bikes for the children in Ghana because they're kind of quite keen to sell them to people <laughs> further away. Uh, but we thought that that was nice to be able to tie those things. What will make a sustainable difference? Um, focusing on continuing supply doesn't necessarily, necessarily address remuneration and control. So all of the big companies now have enormously well-funded programs to ensure that they have a continued supply of cocoa. Their interest and farmers' interests don't necessarily completely align because if you um, increase your yield by using lots of inputs, so if you add nitrogen things to the soil, then you increase your yield, it takes lots of work and you have to pay for the inputs and then you have to probably pay people to help you work on the farm. And you actually might be a net loser. So although you've increased your yield, which is what the big company wanted you to do, you actually might not have earned more money, which then means you can't look after your family better. Also, by having a bigger yield, you might actually bring down the price, which again is in the benefit of the big companies, but not in the interest of the farmers. So it's quite interesting where you need to think a bit harder to think, is this good for farmers? And so the industry hasn't been looking at the remuneration of farmers. It doesn't see that as the solution, which clearly, if the average farmer is 55 and children do not want to be cocoa farmers, that's the issue that you need to address. So higher world prices does not necessarily mean higher prices to farmers, and income for higher volumes is often offset by higher input and labour costs. I think then this might be my last one. <laughs> so farmers might carry on cocoa farming if they have sustainable remuneration, if they have enough to live on to improve their farms, to educate their families and to plan for the future. If they have an opportunity to add value to the cocoa and share in the value of chocolate. If they have the skills to adapt and to diversify, Small-scale farmers are the most efficient farmers in the world if they can, multi, uh, if they can grow multi-crops. So, so what industry tends to do is it wants one thing. I want palm oil, I want cocoa, I want coffee. And what they do is they make people monocrop, and monocropping is a terribly inefficient use of the land, and we will not have enough food for everybody on the planet to eat if we carry on doing that. So if you can help farmers diversify, then they can increase the overall income from their farms which isn't just increasing the amount of cocoa. So if you used half your farm for cocoa and half your farm for things that you were going to eat or sell locally, then you probably would be better off in the long run. Part of, uh, if they're all part of a community or pulling together, sharing facilities, knowledge and accountability and not migrating to the cities and if they're in control of their own business. And so my final slide is... So together we can make cocoa farming worthwhile if we create trading relationships with smallholder farmers which deliver sustainable income, knowledge and power, which encourage a future generation of cocoa farmers where we can create a, a future where chocolate can be celebrated and, served and cherished by everyone and that's our vision. So Divine's vision is that last thing. So thank you very much. Mm, thank you. What proportion of Ghana's cocoa output goes to Divine. So, Quapa Cocoa produce 48,000 tonnes of cocoa, which is 6% of Ghana's output. That's 6%. That's 6% mm. of... No, but I haven't answered mm. the question. We take 1,000 tonnes. So, Ghana's output is about 700,000 tonnes, and, and, and Divine uses 1,000 tonnes. So, teeny, teeny bit. Right, and so the copper cocoa goes to sells elsewhere as well. So copper cocoa supplied the cocoa originally to Cadbury's is an example. So they can sell to other fair trade customers, but they also sell just to the world market. One of the reasons they've been able to get so big is because they have an assured market for everything they sell, because the government still buys all the cocoa. What knowledge is there so far? Is there work going on about the potential impact of climate change on Ghana and the growth of these crops? So at the moment, I would have said that climate change hasn't, um, it hasn't impacted in a definite way in Ghana. And so the, the weather patterns are um, up and down, but the farmers would say they always have been, sort of in a way. So if you take that this year's an El Nino year, then mm. the, when the wind comes and when the rain comes becomes unpredictable from other years. Mm -hmm. And also I suppose farmers are quite philosophical about if you've had a good year, generally you have a bad year. I mean, so that if you're with fruit trees, 
fruit trees work one year and they tend to be less the next year even if there isn't a particular reason to make it so. What you're seeing in terms of if you do modelling is that it looks as if the rain, so Ghana is in, you know, so this is the rainforest, cocoa is a rainforest plant, and, and it rains sort of nearly all the time. I mean, so you've got sort of rain in every month, so if you're looking at your sort of geography book thing. And what they're saying is that they think the rain patterns will become less reliable and that will be problematic. Mm -hmm. And so um, then you might need to be looking at ways of irrigating your farms. At the moment, that hasn't, I, I don't think that's become the case yet, but it is something people are aware of. What strategies are Divine putting in place for climate change adaptation and mitigation? So we work with uh, Quapra working out what the programmes they'd like to spend money on. And at the moment they said they like to spend the money on the literacy schemes that we're doing and the um, radio programmes and investing in helping them improve their business um, processes, so things like their database and membership information systems. I think that what will happen is, is as, t as t over time, if things start to be the case that they're noticing that there is a problem, then they might then decide to spend their money on things that might be about collecting water and irrigating. So at the moment, they're not go doing those things. And in some ways, I mean, one of the things we've been trying to say to them, because we're, we're doing a program, we've decided to really work in Western region, so right at the border of the Ivory Coast, because everybody else, what happens with the way that NGOs work is they go to the places that are easy to get to. And so you fly into Accra and you maybe might fly up to Kumasi and then you work with farms around there. Well, this is the urban areas in Ghana. And so we've purposely gone to, into the Western region, which is really, really deep in the rainforest. And what we've tried, and we're, that we've got them to business development centres and we're saying, can they collect water off the roofs of those business development centres? And can they look at solar? And it's a bit so that they can see that these things happen, so that they could be potential solutions to other problems they've got. So it's a bit, I think the thing that's interesting about working with Quapa is they own us, we don't own them. They make the decisions. All we can do is furnish them with as much information as possible. And so taking people on a journey, you're having to take them on quite a long journey. And they've always been philosophical about what the weather's like. In January, you get a hamatan, which is a wind dust off the Sahara. And that's a difficult time, but it's always been there. And so I think at the moment it's quite difficult for them to think there is something happening to do with climate change.